So once again, welcome everyone to tonight's talk with a very special speaker, Rivera's son, who's with us from Maine now. So from two time zones and a couple of thousand miles away. So we're really happy to have you with us, Rivera. Um, Rivera is going to talk to us tonight on the topic of people, power, peace, how civil society stops war. And just a little bit um, about Rivera. Um, I could, I think that your biography is quite long, <laughs> but I'm going to condense it a bit. I do want people to know uh, a little bit about how many different things you have done. For someone who is as young as you are, I am really impressed with all you've been able to accomplish so far in your life. Rivera is a very creative, daring, and visionary teacher trainer and author who truly believes in that it seems to me who truly lives and believes the power in the power of love to be able to make positive changes for humanity and for the planet um, she's also a ferocious advocate for social justice and a firm believer in nonviolent action and she does a lot of training in that area um, Rivera has written um, is it about a dozen books now Rivera yeah, and they're wonderfully written, very imaginative, compelling tales that seek to awaken and empower readers of all ages. Um, For nearly a decade now, um, this popular book, it's the, the Dandelion is Insurrection, which there's a, three of them. They have sold, I think, thousands of copies annually. And in 2015, she conducted a 50-city grassroots organized speaking tour on the Dandelion Insurrection. And I will just mention this right now. Arthur Clark, who you can see on the screen, has very kindly um, purchased a copy of this book and the accompanying um, study guide, um, as well as one other book, I believe, Arthur, that will be, he's generously offered to donate to Plowshares Library. So those will be available for others to borrow. Um, Rivera has also written the criti critically acclaimed Ari Ara series, which has been enjoyed by readers of all ages. And she was just telling me that just earlier today, she was in communication with um, a group of children in a Calgary school, a Montessori school, that where they have been studying those books as novel studies for a number of years already. And and uh, she, hopefully, it sounds like maybe there's some burgeoning young peacemakers <laughs> that are going to, to be um, growing up with some really positive stories about the changes we can make in the world. Um, the second novel in that series the Lost Dare was nominated for the Dayton Literary Peace Prize, which is the United States' most prestigious peace literature prize, and that was in 2020. Rivera is also the founding editor of the prize-winning Nonviolence News. She is currently the program coordinator for Campaign Nonviolence. Her articles are syndicated by Peace Voice and published in hundreds of journals nationwide and I think internationally as well. Rivera serves on the advisory board of World Beyond War and the board of Backbone Campaign. So we were just we are just delighted to have you with us. And I must also say I'm delighted to have so many of you join us. Thank you for coming to participate in this tonight. And I know we'll have all have a lot to learn from you, Rivera. So I'll turn it over to you now. Well, thank you so much, and thank you all for inviting me to come and speak with you this evening. Uh, this particular set of stories that I'm going to share tonight is very near and dear to my heart. Uh, it was not a subject that I grew up hearing about, and it's not a subject that many of us know how deep and wide and enormous the the catalog of case studies is becoming in terms of how nonviolent action resists war and mil militarism. Now, as plowshare activists, you probably will be less surprised than your average citizen because you've lived these stories, right? So the first thing I want to do is ask you a question. Can you open up your chat box 
and put into the chat box on a scale of one to 10, one being not very likely and 10 being very likely, how possible do you think it is for ordinary people, not politicians, not saints, just ordinary people like us to stop war on a scale from one to 10, 10 being, yes, we can do this, one being, nope, never happens. Go ahead and put a number in the chat box. Okay, we got an eight, a three, seven, a three, four, four, threes, five, somewhere in the middle, seven, two, eight, five, two. Okay, good to know. There's no right or wrong answer to this. Uh, we'll come back to this by the end of the presentation, and I'll see what you think by the end of the presentation, okay? <laughs> All right. So when a war breaks out, as they so often do, especially when we have so much invested in um, waging war in, between the nations around the world, particularly my own nation, the United States, which is the greatest warmonger on earth. Um, like when a war burning. breaks out, so we like... often ask, what can we do? Or it smells like it to me. Sorry, Rivera, I'm just going to interrupt a moment. I always forget to uh, to remind everyone to um, mute themselves. So if you could kindly take a moment to do that now, if you haven't. Thank you, and sorry for the No worries, it happens. All right. So whenever war breaks out, we ask ourselves, what can we do? Ah, and we start to scramble around thinking, what are the strategies? What are the tools? What are the tactics that we can use to stop this horrible thing? Tonight is about getting to take a step back and hear the stories around the world so that we know some of the answers to those questions for this war, the next one, and ultimately the last war, because someday, we are going to see the last war that humanity ever fights. And I hold that vision and I work towards that vision because I know one day it's going to come. So tonight we're going to look at how we've used nonviolent action to prevent war, replace war with a different kind of struggle, which I view as the ultimate prevention. We're going to look even at how we work to win, quote unquote, a war or in a broader context, a struggle using nonviolent tactics. I'll say more about that when we get there. Uh, we're going to look at how we've carved out space for peace amidst war and thus hastened the end of it or pushed for the end of that war. And then we're going to also look at how we've worked to dismantle the pieces of the war machine so that uh, it is less likely to generate yet another war. And to do this, it often involves building long lasting nonviolent infrastructure for the human needs for security and defense. I have a few disclaimers as I do this, uh, because it's very easy to hear all this and be like, oh, we've got the blueprint and we've got it all worked it out, worked out. No, we don't have all the answers. In the field of civil resistance and nonviolent action, we are still very much learning. And there could be a lot more research done on these stories and examples so that we can be the most skillful peace activists that we possibly can. You should consider tonight an introduction and just know that there are more examples of how we have stopped and prevented war than we think. That was maybe the biggest thing I learned when I started doing this research. I always thought maybe I'd come up with one or two examples. We're going to talk about around um, 20 to 30 examples tonight. But there are always going to be multiple narratives around each struggle. And what I mean by this is when a war ends, there's going to be a lot of people who claim that they ended the war namely armies, politicians, diplomats, um, negotiating teams, the people who actually sit down and sign the peace accords. And oftentimes the story of 
ordinary people's involvement is glossed over or overlooked or undervalued. So if I tell you about a story tonight and you're reading something different online or you've heard a different story, that's okay. There are going to be multiple narratives. I'm just trying to bring forward one that maybe doesn't get told as often. There are going to be some differences in these kind of struggles from what I call peacetime struggles, which maybe is not the right word, but I'll talk about that when we get there. All right, let's, let's dive in. So I want to start with this idea that the very biggest and boldest way that nonviolent action is stopping war is by actually replacing the use of violence uh, as a means of waging struggle. And we are actually seeing this on a global scale, particularly in the use of nonviolent struggle to replace civil wars. So you don't like the regime and the government? Instead of picking up weapons or having a coup, people are organizing mass uh, civil disobedience and protests until they kick the dictator or the authoritarian regime out of power. I know this because I edit nonviolence news and I collect 30 to 50 stories of nonviolence in action each and every single week. And I am seeing these stories play out in real time all across the globe. I've been doing this for four years and it is just truly remarkable what people are doing. When you look at every nonviolent campaign and you recognize that the other option, options is to do nothing or to pick up some guns and go fight it out, you can start to recognize that the use of nonviolent action as a pragmatic and effective tool for getting social justice is one of our greatest strategies for peace available to us at this time. I collect stories on all kinds of issues, so it's not just one kind of social justice issue versus another. But there are some pretty dramatic examples that are worth knowing about. In 2019, Bolivia had an election that was somewhat like the 2020 elections here in the United States, in that the, um, the right-wing candidate challenged the official election results that said that the left-wing president, uh, Evo Morales, had won. They caused such an uproar that they then backed up with um, the threat of the generals to pull a coup that they actually undermined the entire election and forced Evo Morales to leave the country, bringing a right-wing regime to power. At this point, the left wing could have decided to start a civil war, to march in and take back their government. Instead, led by the indigenous people, they set up a year and a half long worth of roadblocks and civil resistance campaigns that first of all, stopped the right wing government's genocidal campaign against indigenous people. And second of all, um, forced them to hold new elections that were more credible and certified, which brought, which got the right wing out of power and brought the a new left wing government into power. This is what I mean by nonviolent struggle is replacing war, and it is one of the greatest peace actions happening on a mass scale. It's not only recent, it has been happening steadily and increasingly over the years. We saw the dismantling of the Soviet Union through the independence struggles, including in Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. Uh, also in countries like Czechoslovakia, Serbia, uh, Poland, the list actually goes on. Uh, it's really incredible to think about the wave of nonviolent resistance that asserted popular demands for sovereignty and independence. This story that happened in 2021 uh, is not just humorous, uh, but it's poignant as well. In 2021, the Zapatistas from Mexico decided they were gonna make a point to Spain and they got on a boat and they sailed to Spain and they landed at this beach and they planted this their flag and they claimed all of Spain in the name of the Zapatistas. Because, you know, this is what the Spaniards had done to them 500 years ago. So to call the bluff on colonization, they turned it on its head. Now they chose to do this with nonviolent action, which is not actually something that the Zapatistas have always chosen. They have been an armed resistance movement in their past. 
But if they had chosen to use armed resistance to sail a boat into Spain and decamp with their weapons, we would have seen a bloodbath, not an act of political theater that got nationwide and global attention and really got people thinking about the invalidity of colonization. To achieve their goals, the only thing that would have done that tactically was nonviolent action. Now, Indigenous people around the world, including in Canada, are at the forefront of advancing this idea of asserting one's sovereignty and defending one's nation, not with violence, but with nonviolence. We're seeing this in New Zealand, where the Maori have waged a successive number of campaigns to reclaim land, to stand up for rights and dignity. Uh, one of the more notable struggles that you will all know about in Canada is the Wet'suwet'en blockade. Uh, I think this is actually a, I'm gonna, a, a solidarity action in another part of Canada that you're looking at, shutting down the rail lines. But over and over again, Indigenous people have been waging what we would be calling wars if they were using violence but using nonviolent struggle to achieve their goals and having a surprising number level of success in that. So let's look at that next category, preventing war. So one of the things that we can do with nonviolent action is stop a war from occurring. And this is really important because it's much easier to prevent a war than to stop it once it starts to get some steam under its belt. One of the little known stories that I love is about the Algerians. Now, some of you may remember the Algerians had a very bloody, brutal war of independence from France in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, it was horrifically brutal. But what we don't often know is that after Algeria won their independence, the two, can the two political factions couldn't come to agreement about anything. And they actually dissolved their uh, parliament and decided to launch a civil war. Now the people who had just gone through a, a bloody war said, oh no, we are not having this. They took to the streets. They blockaded tanks. They laid down in front of the soldiers and said, you will not pass over us. Now, this was not without risk and cost. 1,000 people died as the Civil War started to pick up steam. At any point, they could have said, well, the only way to replay blood is with more blood, right? Or they could have felt justified in escalating their Civil War. But no, the people were clear. No more war. And indeed, within a few months, they stopped the civil war from happening. They forced their political parties to get back to the negotiating table, and they moved forward with a democratic government. More recently, in 2023, uh, we had a very interesting example in Niger of a situation that could very quickly have become a war. Niger had a president and then they had a military coup that kicked the president out of power. France wanted the previous president to stay in power, but the people of Niger did not want France to decide their destiny. So when France tried to get ECOWAS, which is like the NATO of Africa, to make a long story short, to invade Niger and put down the military coup, the people of Niger said no. And they got their friends in Nigeria to get Nigeria to pull out of that maneuver. And they got their, their friends in other countries to back out of sending in ECOWAS. Then they went to the military bases where the French soldiers were stationed. And there were about a couple thousand troops on the ground in Niger. And they held these mass demonstrations and said, you must go home now. Whatever mess we are in, it is our mess to solve. It is not your mess. And instead of having a war happen, they reclaimed their sovereignty and their struggle is now theirs to figure out. You will find surprising examples of this all throughout history. And I wish we taught peace history instead of war history. 
In 1905, Sweden and Norway were one country. And when the rumbles started to be heard that Norway was going to secede, Sweden said, over our dead body, we're going to invade and take you back. Well, the workers of Sweden and Norway said, no, we do not want a war. We don't want to fight and die in your war. And we will go on general strike if you try to start a war with Norway when this, they secede. And indeed, this is exactly what happened. Norway seceded. Sweden said, we're going to invade. The workers threatened to strike. And Sweden backed off and let Norway have their independence. This is a tactic that we could use today. We could mobilize our workers en masse to say no in large numbers. We will not fight these wars. One of the campaigns where we saw this dramatically work with the use of a pledge of resistance and thousands of people doing mass civil dis disobedience is in the resistance to the US escalation of um, the war and the armed um, paramilitary violence in El Salvador and then in Nicaragua, Nicaragua in 1984 to 1990. This campaign throughout the U.S. mobilized thousands of people. There was a two-year campaign outside the training facility that week after week pushed back um, against the plan to invade uh, Nicaragua and El Salvador. And indeed, they succeeded in getting the US government to feel that they could not politically pull this off. We see um, in the midst of broader conflicts or broader struggles, moments where a situation of nonviolent revolution could turn and transform into a bloodbath and descend into civil war. And nonviolent action has been used to stop that from occurring. In the Philippines in the People Power Revolution in 1986, when millions of people took to the streets to get rid of the dictator Ferdinand Marcos, there was a moment where Ferdinand Marcos ordered the military to put down a mutiny at one of the army barracks. And the tanks were on their way to go start shooting the, um, the revolutionary uh, flank in the, the barracks. And the Archbishop, Cardinal, or the Cardinal, Cardinal Sin was his name, got on the radio and said, people of the Philippines, go to the streets, go and stop those tanks, we don't need a war. And the nuns led the charge, they literally got down on their knees and said, in the name of God, please stop, do not do this. And the people stopped the tanks in the streets and kept their revolution from descending into a bloodbath of a civil war. This is an example that is useful, not just in the context of a nonviolent revolution, but also in a context when we see uh, militarized police being brought out to put down protesters. Can a third party intervene? Can we as citizens stop that from occurring? Every now and then, we ourselves are in that particular position to take a grand action that changes everything. We all owe our lives to this man right here, Stanislav Petrov. He was uh, working in the USSR's nuclear arsenal when he got a report that the US had fired on Russia and he was ordered to push the button and drop the bombs or to fire the bombs back. Had he done this, he would have set off the cascade of nuclear exchange that would have annihilated the world. But he said, we need better verification. Please verify that these reports are true. Three times he said this, three times he was threatened with court being court-martialed, but he refused to push the button until he heard. And indeed it turned out that the report was false. And had he not stood up to his, his superiors, we would not be here today. So when and if you were in that situation to be Stanislav Petrov and to either push or not push that button, it's up to you to not push that button that doesn't start off the next war. One of the things about this, this type of use of nonviolent action is that we forget about it so quickly. 
Because we have war history and war culture, we notice when wars happen, and we swiftly forget when they do not happen. Some of you might remember when uh, my president, not my president, Trump, but um, when the president of the U.S., Trump, agitated war with North Korea and was threatening to drop nuclear bombs and do a nuclear exchange. The South Koreans took to the streets en masse and galvanized the world's attention, including the U.S. citizens' attention, who weren't really paying that much of it of focus to this and said, stop this now, de-escalate, do not escalate. Now, many of us don't even remember this campaign, even though it was fairly recent. And that's one of the challenges we face in documenting these stories and learning from. So I'm going to pause there for a second because you'll go into overload. But what I would love to, for you to do is to put into the chat box one word that's coming up as you hear these stories. What's a word that's coming to mind as you listen to all of these? Mm, inspired, empowering, better history. Yeah, a seven. Okay, you're now you're now at a seven on that ten point scale. Glad to hear it. Possibilities, hope, determined, hope. Right. So we need to remember to surround ourselves with these stories and to study the stories. What's a word that's coming to mind as you listen to all of these? Mm, inspired, empowering, better history. Yeah, a seven. Okay, you're now, you're now at a seven on that 10 point scale. Glad to hear it. Possibilities, hope, determined, hope. Right. So we need to remember to surround ourselves with these stories and to study them because we can't just do this once a year, right? We need to be doing this every single day. And we need to be inviting our friends to do this too, so they know these stories. All right, I'm gonna go on because we really wanna talk about the next part of it, what to do if the war breaks out. So this is maybe the most controversial thing I'll say tonight, but I think it's very interesting. So when a war breaks out, we in the peace movement often feel like our only choice is either to silently comply with the with our friends who feel like we need to fight this war or to only have to just oppose all the the war itself. Now sometimes we're caught in a tricky situation because we actually agree with the cause. The cause is just. What we can do in those situations is support and advocate nonviolent tactics to be used to fight differently amidst, sometimes even amidst the war. Sometimes we're not in a position to actually stop all the violence. And this has been particularly true in, for people organizing in Ukraine. This may be a really good example of this, um, but it has happened many times in history. One of the most incredible set of stories comes out of the place that I get the most challenge on. I start talking about nonviolent action and people are always like, well, what about the Nazis? And I always say, well, I'm glad you asked about that because I actually have a whole set of stories about how people nonviolently resisted the Nazis from the Berlin wives who rescued their Jewish husbands with protests in Berlin to Sophie Scholl and the White Rose, which maybe didn't have such a rosy ending as some of you know to stories like the Dutch bankers resistance, which there's a great Netflix movie about. But Denmark maybe holds the grand prize for having some of the most dramatic stories. Denmark rescued 7,800 Jews, 7,800 Jews right out from under the noses of the Nazi occupation. And they did this predominantly with nonviolent action, hiding people, checking them into hospitals under false names, and whisking them away to the neutral territory of Sweden. The Norway, uh, in Norway, which was also occupied by the Nazis, the teachers put up this remarkable 30,000 person struggle to stop the Nazi curriculum from being implemented in the schools. The teachers en masse said, no, we will not teach this nonsense. Even when they were threatened with being rounded up and imprisoned, which is what the Nazi government did. They 
rounded up 30,000 uh, teachers, they put them on trains, and they shipped them to the Norwegian version of Siberia. Now, the people of Norway came to the tracks, and they handed the teachers blankets and food through the slats of the railway cars, and thus showing that they had the support of the people. And because of this, the Nazi propaganda was never implemented and never succeeded in taking root in the Norwegians throughout the course of the occupation. These types of tactics are actually really well known. This is a declassified US World War II espionage and sabotage manual from the 1940s. And if you look at some of these, you will see nonviolent tactics listed out. Work slowly. Think of ways to increase the number of movements necessary on your job. Uh, use a light hammer instead of a slow, heavy one. Use a small wrench uh, when a big one is necessary. Now, in Denmark, the Nazis really wanted them to build warships. And the, the shipyard workers would literally screw in bolts. And when the Nazis weren't looking, they would unscrew the bolts. This was so successful that by the end of the war, they had not built one single warship for the Nazis. When you think about this happening in every country, this is an under accounted for type of resistance that I think if we truly accounted for it, we would see that it had a tremendous impact on how that war played out. There are other examples as well. During the US Civil War, 800,000 enslaved African Americans left the plantations and made their way to freedom in uh, the, the Northern uh, Army camps. This was um, about a quarter of the enslaved population. It is a significant number of people and it threw the plantations in the Southern United States into chaos and turmoil as all these people left and were not doing their jobs. Um, did this have an impact on the eventual winning of the war by the, the North? I would say, and I would argue that it must have. There is no way that it didn't. We also know that during the War of Independence in Algeria, French citizens en masse protested in favor of ending French colon colonization of Algeria and getting France to withdraw. They even went so far as to put down a coup attempt uh, on their president after the independence papers were, were signed. So, uh, you know, the use of nonviolent action amidst all of these scenarios gives us power and potential, even amidst a war, and should not be overlooked in our toolbox of how we can hasten the end of a war, particularly when we agree that the cause is just. We know that in Ukraine, people have been resisting Russian occupation. Uh, one particular town early on even forced the Russian soldiers to leave and to release their mayor. Ironically, the only demand that the Russians had were that the people disarm and turn in their weapons. I find it ironic because they had achieved all the, the their goals without using their weapons. And when the Russians rounded up all their guns, there was no way they could round up all their nonviolent weapons because you can't take away a person's courage once they have it. So a few key points on using tactics amidst all this. Uh, it's gonna increase your ability to wage struggle because you're gonna mobilize an unarmed population. This can be really helpful when your population has been disarmed. It's gonna broaden the resistance from the strapping guys and girls who are okay fighting a violent war to the grandmothers uh, to the uh, children, to the workers, to the hospital workers, you know, it's going to give you more tools. This, of course, can help you achieve the goals that you're seeking. You can deny occupiers and invaders their objectives. And it could be, there's some dynamics that are distinct from peacetime struggles, particularly around when we're waging a nonviolent campaign for a social justice cause in a peacetime situation, we often try to keep violence out of it entirely. 
Um, we often have to denounce violence, violent flanks. In a wartime situation, we don't always have that luxury. And we're still learning a lot uh, from the examples around the world about how this dynamic is playing out. Again, this is a very understudied aspect of civil resistance that I would like us to know more about. And it is overshadowed by violence. And when we calculate what won the war, I feel like we are never really truly calculating some of this. And we're going to talk about that in a particular example in a moment. All right. So the war is going on. Guess what? There's more that we can be doing. We can carve out space for peace. New research shows that every time we carve out isolated or limited ceasefires, even within one village, it hastens the end of a war because for many reasons. But one of the, the big reasons is it actually opens the creative and imaginative idea in people's minds that this war will end. So some of the groups that are also doing carving out zones of peace include groups like Nonviolent Peace Force, which goes into hot conflict zones and provides civilian protection, protective accompaniment, violence de-escalation, and a number of other things. Peace teams are when we take large groups of people, we train them in, in these skills of de-escalation, and we deploy them uh, strategically to provide an alternative to armed defense. The idea was started by um, Gandhi and by the example of the Kudai Kidmitgar uh, and Bajra Khan in the context of the Indian uh, independence movement. This man organized, he was Pashtun, Muslim, and he organized an 80,000 person peace army that withstood the worst of the British repression during these eras. This gave rise to the Shante Sina network, which deployed people to try to de-escalate violence in conflict zones. And this in turn gave rise to groups like Nonviolent Peace Force, Peace Brigades International, and a number of other groups that do this work today. This is a powerful and unexpected branch of peace work that deserves more of our attention. We've also seen people self-organize their own campaigns, create spaces of peace, like the Syrian literally underground library that creates an oasis where people can uh, come out of the ravages of war. People also create limit, more limited ceasefires, such as in Yemen, there was a ceasefire that was negotiated by women, which is unusual in their context. Um, to repair a well and stop the violent conflict that was happening over access to that well. This is a 30 year long conflict that people thought nobody could solve and the women solved it. We also see things like the Columbia Peace Villages, um, which in the midst of uh, civil war, armed guerrilla groups uh, have said, no more weapons, no more war in the confines of our village. We will not take sides in this conflict anymore. And even though they have withstood uh, massacres and attacks, they have remained committed to peace. What we see is this hastens the end of a war. Uh, this is what the new research is showing, that these kind of actions of creating new space for peace actually help people get to the end of it. But there are other things that we can do as well. One of the most dramatic examples is the Women of Liberia Mass Action for Peace. And if you have not seen the documentary Pray the Devil Back to Hell, I highly recommend it. In the midst of the Second Liberian Civil War, uh, Lima Gabowi and a number of other women gathered the Christian and, and Muslim women and prayed for peace in the pathway of the dictator Charles um, Taylor. And more or less, to make a long story short, forced him to come to the negotiating table with the rebel groups. Now, as the rebel army was descending on Monrovia, the capital city, they had achieved their goal of getting peace talks in a neighboring country. But the women knew if they just let the men go talk in a room for weeks, they would get nothing done. So they went to the peace talks. 
And they, um, when they were, the men were stalling, they sat down in front of the doors and they said, you cannot come out until you come out with a peace agreement. And indeed they did, which then stopped the army marching on Monrovia. It led to Charles Taylor resigning as president and the country holding the first, dem uh, holding democratic elections, which led to the first female president being elected. This is an incredible example of peace action in some of the worst conditions in the world, the most unlikely places for achieving this goal. We have also seen uh, similarly uh, what brought about, largely brought about the end of the Troubles and the Good Friday Peace Accord was women in Northern Ireland mobilizing 50,000 people every single weekend to march for peace and to say, this conflict has gone on too long, that we are getting nowhere, we are entrenched and nothing is being resolved. We also know of examples like the Haudenosaunee Great Law of Peace in which the um, five nations of the Haudenosaunee uh, had been warring uh, with one another for years and years. And the great peacemaker and uh, came and went from one group to the next, talking them into uh, agreeing to a peace accord. When they did, they literally buried their hatchets, which is where we get the colloquial phrase to bury the hatchet under the, the tree of peace and signed the great law of peace. Uh, there's a lot to know about this story and it's not really my, my place to tell all of it, but it is well worth learning more about. The story I'd like us to really reflect on deeply is what ended World War I? We're all often told the narrative that, oh, you know, uh, France won and Germany surrendered. <laughs> and it leaves out a couple of important things. First of all, as early as 1914, that famous Christmas Day truce happened when German and French soldiers on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day said, hey, let's put down our weapons and let's just relax for a day. This is in the middle of the trenches and they played football and they shared oranges and swapped cigarettes. And then the next day they got up and they started shooting each other again. However, this momentary ceasefire so frightened the political leaders that they threatened any soldier who did it the next year with an immediate execution because they knew that if they let those soldiers stop fighting, they would end the war. Well, that didn't quite work out for them in the long run because German sailors in particular, there were a couple chapters of strikes that actually brought the World War I to a close. Uh, the, the Russian Revolution happened and the Bolsheviks had campaigned on leaving World War I, which they did do when they came to power, which was not a nonviolent struggle whatsoever. So Russia left because of the revolution, but Germany was still fighting until this happened. The high fleet of the Germans had been recalled to their naval base and they had been doing repairs and things like that. Then they were going to send the German sailors back out to fight the British. The German sailors said, no. They said, we don't want to do this. And the higher ups actually found the ringleaders of the people who had organized a protest against it and they executed them. They executed four or five leaders. Now the sailors said, That's a, that is a straw on our camel's back. And they walked out en masse. They left the ships and they went on strike. This forced Germany to surrender this strike right here. It didn't stay entirely nonviolent, but the active um, kind of mechanism of it was their strike. If you don't know this piece of World War I history, we're really missing an important part of what ended that war. One of, one of the hardest things to win with nonviolent struggle is around genocide. And this is poignant because of what's happening in Gaza today. The one, one example to look to is how the genocide in East Timor was stopped. Um, Indonesia was 
massacring the East Timorese. They had annexed the their land and the East Timor independence movement had been severely repress, repressed and cracked down on. So they started organizing international solidarity. And what brought the genocide to a close was the international solidarity pressured the US government to end military aid to the Suharto regime in Indonesia. Within weeks of the US cutting off military aid, Indonesia stopped their, their genocide in East Timor and ultimately within a year or two granted independence to East Timor. This is a story to know more about because of its relevance to what we see happening in the world today. Even when our peace actions do not seem like they are succeeding, they are important to do nonetheless. We often set in motion the very conditions by which peace can be achieved at a future date. And when we stand up for peace, even or maybe especially when war is breaking out all around us, it is very important to notice that we may have more allies than we think. Breaking the silent complicity or consent to war is one of the most important things for peace movements to achieve. So I want you to put in the chat box, um, is there a story that we just talked about that you hadn't heard of before? Something that was new for you? What was it? Ooh, I feel like my whole life is validated. I'm so glad that I could bring these stories here. Oh, fantastic. Oh, so glad I asked you this. Well, I don't feel so alone. This was exactly my experience when I was challenged to put together this presentation, this kind of a presentation, I knew about the women of Liberia. And then I started researching and I was like, wait a minute, there's something going on. Maybe we actually have more power than we think. Can you stand to hear a few more stories? Okay, great, because there are a few. So we've ended the war, but great, three cheers for that, right? How do we make war less likely? Now this is gonna be kind of familiar to many of us because we do this work as peace activists. We do things like we shut down military bombing ranges and we get bases closed down like they did in Vicky's uh, Puerto Rico. We get uh, universities to oppose military research on campus or divest their uh, endowments from weapons manufacturing. Uh, we do things like stop NATO maneuvers or stop military bases as uh, Cinta Javina in Montenegro has done. Now an update here, they kicked out the NATO maneuvers. This was in 2023, I'm gonna say 2024, uh, two. But they more recently stopped an entire training facility from being built in the same place. So I'm very impressed by what they've done. You know, and there's examples like the Japanese resistance to military expansion, which is a really important uh, campaign that they're working on. But one of the things that we need to know more about is that there is a whole theory and a whole school of thought that says these tactics of nonviolent civil resistance are so robust and have so much potential that we should be investing as nations in understanding how they work so we can defend ourselves with them. We now know that nonviolent action is twice as likely to succeed as violence. Did, did you get that memo? It's twice as likely to succeed as violent struggle. So we need to be studying it more. Civilian-based defense is this idea that our nations could actually take it seriously. It's marked by the idea that we're going to plan, prepare, and train to use mass nonviolent action to defend our country. It's not an ad hoc struggle. We don't just invent it as we go along. 
And ideally, these plans can work as a deterrent to people invading us or trying to occupy us. They can also be used to thwart invasions, coups, and occupations, and as you'll see in a moment, defend the Earth uh, against harm. It works because we uh, do things like deny aggressors their objectives, like the Danish shipyard workers. It also broadens resistance. Um, it can cause uh, subvert reliability of the troops. So if we're being occupied, our occupiers can't depend on their troops to actually do what they want. And ultimately, the best strategy with this is to deter these kind of invasions from happening. Some nations are taking it seriously. Switzerland uh, actually had a total defense strategy where they weren't really willing to give up their military strategy, but they were willing to integrate civil resistance and nonviolent action into it. And the kind of uh, metaphor they used was to be like a hedgehog, to be prickly and hard to swallow if anybody tried to gobble them up. Uh, you know, we talked about how this was used in Denmark, which was invaded and occupied. But this was also used in Czechoslovakia when Soviets uh, came in and occupied the country. Now, they used a wide range of tactics on the ground to stop the Soviets. Uh, they even had their Ten Commandments. Don't, if a Soviet soldier comes to you, you don't know, don't care, don't tell, don't have, don't know how to, don't give, can't do, don't sell, don't show, do nothing. They were quite successful in this 1968 campaign. The only thing that set them back from achieving this, this um, the ousting of the Soviets was that they didn't have the internet capacity that we had today. Because when their representatives were summoned to Moscow to uh, deal with this situation, their representatives uh, caved to the Soviets because they couldn't get real information on the ground about how strong the resistance was in the streets in Czechoslovakia. Had they been able to tell that, they could have held out against the Russians and kicked them out, or the Soviets, and kicked them out. Now, as it was, they didn't achieve their goal in 1968, but within 20 years, they had another nonviolent revolution, the Velvet Revolution, and they gained their independence. Now, when I first heard about this, when I was like, you know, 28 or so, that seemed like forever. It was like my whole lifetime. Now that I'm 42, I'm like, what? It's like a blink of an eye. It's not so long ago. So, Another country to look at is Lithuania. They had their nonviolent revolution against the Soviets in 1991. And then they promptly integrated uh, civilian-based defense into their constitution. This was so strong that they even had pamphlets they would hand out to the citizenry, training them in how to use nonviolent action if they were going to be invaded again. Now, you may have caught wind of this, but in, I think it was... I'm going to say 2019-ish. NATO was doing some maneuvers on Russia's border and Russia was getting prickly and they were planning an invasion of Lithuania the way that they did in Ukraine. So Lithuania reissued their civilian-based defense pamphlets and they said something like, well, in the event that a larger country, <coughs> Russia, uh, chooses to invade us, let's be prepared. And they made a very well publicized training and preparation that demonstrated that their people were ready to use non-cooperation, strikes, boycotts, um, refusals to comply, uh, civil disobedience, mass non-cooperation until they kicked any invaders out. And you know what? Russia never invaded Lithuania for, for maybe that and other reasons. This is a story that can, comes from Quebec, uh, where a civil resistance researcher who's well-versed in civilian-based defense said, well, if we can use it against uh, armies, can we use it against corporate armies, AKA frackers? So they made a plan of defense and they trained to defend Quebec in the event that the fracking companies would come in and invade them and drill for natural gas. 
They held trainings that they invited the press to. They even calculated the cost that the frackers would incur if they tried to drill. So if the frackers came in, they knew that they could cost them a million dollars a day by blocking their equipment, by locking down to things, by denying them access to water. And they publicized this to the point where the, the investors in the fracking company got really scared of how much money they were gonna lose in Quebec and they pulled out. And Quebec still does not have fracking happening. These stories are meant to illustrate the potential that we have in using these tools of nonviolent action with increasing strategy and effectiveness. So when we look at what we can do to stop war, we have so much more power than we commonly think. But it's important to know a few points, like we need to organize now, not just when the newest conflict breaks out. We need to be studying and training in these. There are going to be easier and harder times to stop a war. Right after it breaks out is often the hardest point. When it's been dragging on forever, there's often opportunities for a peace movement to rise up and push for a closure. We need to be studying this stuff because we really need it. Uh, we also need to recognize that most of these campaigns have gone beyond protest and letters to their politicians. They almost all of them have used non-cooperation and acts of intervention. Every single person is gonna have a role and leverage points in their conflict and understanding those as societies makes us more powerful. One of the things we can do consistently is to always support anti-war voices and especially among aggressors. When Russia inv invaded Ukraine, all my US friends asked me, what can we do, what can we do? And I said, support the, anti the Russian anti-war movement because they need our support and it will de-escalate our own country's warmongering to form solidarity with them. Uh, remember, if you are invaded, fighting with nonviolent tactics is an option. Peace is not a popularity contest. It is almost always unpopular when a war is brewing until we actually start winning. And then everyone wants to give us the Nobel Peace Prize, right? So we don't do this work because it's popular and we should prepare ourselves for um, to be intensely unpopular for a while. And again, there, there are things like know your goals, right? Are you wanting to win a war or are you just wanting to end the, the war, just have a cessation of violence? Because those will change your strategies. And then most importantly, we need to work continuously on peace infrastructure and peace culture and dismantling war and militarism. That is one of our most important strategies for stopping war. So I'm going to pause there because you have all been so kind to listen to all of these stories, but I want to make sure that we have time for your comments and questions tonight. I think, I hope, I hope you feel that this is very hopeful, that there's more tools in our toolbox than we commonly think, and that uh, there are a lot more strategies that we could be using than we often know about. So thank you. Well, thank you so much, Rivera. It is, it's a little bit, I feel a little bit struck dumb almost by the numbers of um, examples you gave and many of which were unfamiliar to me and likely to, it sounds like maybe to others as well. And uh, it's a lot to take in. Um, maybe before, I, I won't say anything else right now because I do want to leave time for questions. And I see one hand up. If you do have a hand up, uh, if you would like to ask a question, if you would like to just use that hand up um, little icon, that would be helpful for us. So um, Jan, would you like to go ahead with your question? Sure. Um, one of the stories I hadn't heard of before was the women in Yemen. And I'm curious about how you learned of that and what 
the women did. Just a bit more detail about that. Yeah, thanks. I did not have time to tell you all the amazing details. Um, in that particular instance, the conflict was entrenched and the women, particularly these young women, had come back from university into their home communities. And they they just looked at the situation and said, why don't we solve this? And they started going woman to woman, family to family, saying what would be a solution to getting this well repaired uh, so that we now have two wells in these adjacent communities and people have access to water. To get that done, they had to go to the council, which was all men. And the men, kind of like in Liberia, were just posturing and st stalling and not getting anything done. So they actually marched into the council chambers, which was a huge social and political taboo uh, in their society. And they sat down in the middle of the meeting and they said, we're going to work this out right here and right now. We're not leaving until we do. Um, and they came out of the room with a plan to um, repair the well and get people access to water again. People were literally shooting each other over who got to use this well and the point of like children were getting shot. Uh, and I heard about it almost randomly. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I will try to get Maria kind of a bibliography of all these examples and case studies that she can email out to you all. Thank you. That would be that would be uh, there's so many of those stories that I'm sure many of us just want to know more about because they're unfamiliar. And that was a really interesting one. Thank you for that question, Jen. Julie, would you like to go ahead with your comment or question? Sure, I'd just like to make a couple comments and Rivera really appreciate the presentation. Um, I think more than anything right now, we do need some hope and some inspiration um, as we see what's happening in Gaza uh, in particular, but there's also many other really destructive conflicts that are happening around the world. Um, but I'd just like to make mention of, you know, here in Calgary, some really important um, struggles that we've been a part of and I know Plowshares was involved through the years, or members were, it was around Talisman and uh, their work as a corporation in both Sudan and in Peru, and uh, collectively working with different organizations to get them out of Sudan in particular, because they were helping fuel the war and getting them out of Peru, because it was a Calgary company. And so getting them out of Peru, uh, because in, down in Peru, uh, the impact that it was having on the Atchuar, the indigenous people in their land, polluting their land uh, with pressure and lots of uh, great collaboration with the Atchuar people and other organizations, we were able to uh, get Talisman out of out of Peru, and uh, it was quite remarkable work. It was, it was, it was incredible. Uh, so I just like to make mention of those two Calgary examples, and I'm sure there's so many more. Um, but I'm wondering, uh, you know, we're in this world right now where we have, ex and I'm just, uh, even if we just think of North America, uh, Canada, and the U.S., extreme polarization that's happening, but it is happening around the world. Right, people not even being able to talk to each other, and 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 so we have this taking place, and even to people that um, we should be able to agree with, right? There's all sorts of calling out happening. There's all sorts of issues around, um, you know, just if you don't agree with me, then on everything, then we can't connect. Like we're just in this really interesting place, and. Trauma also plays a role in that intergenerational trauma. Um, we're seeing that play out in the Middle East, right? I, you can see these things happening. So I guess I wonder um, when we're building our, our, um, our, and I hate to use these words because they're military words, but army of revolution, right? Of peace revolutionaries. Um, how, how would you say that we, as we build this over time, because this, this is lifetime work, what are your thoughts around these kind of pieces, around the polarization, intergenerational trauma, um, and just the things that you're seeing happening today? 
Mm, yeah. One of the things about cramming all these stories into one hour is that you, you, you don't get that aspect of it. Every single one of these stories is a hot button issue where people are literally killing each other o- over the conflict, right? Uh, toxic polarization has gone to its extremes in every single one of these examples that we, we've been telling the story of. So uh, w- unfortunately, you're not alone in, in this moment, but I guess fortunately, there are some things that we can glean from, from the stories. Uh, one of which is another piece of the nonviolence toolbox is around peace building, de-escalation, um, building common ground, and it's a whole other kind of aspect of the work. Uh, and it can be critically important to getting people to be able to see each other as human beings again. I often think about continuing with the work, continuing with the tangible actions that start to make a shift on the issue, even when nobody can agree on the surface at all, (laughs) right? So everybody's mad at me because I think um, you know, there should be a ceasefire and a negotiation, and they just want a ceasefire. Um, as long as you all keep going on strike for a ceasefire, that's great. Start there. Just keep do keep doing the work, um, because the contentiousness will always be there. Uh, I think the other thing that I think about a lot is this great thing that my friend Kazuhaga said that when we escalate polar pol- uh, when we escalate struggle particularly direct action polarization is naturally going to occur that's part of struggle but we need to also escalate compassion and escalate our principles of nonviolence and double down on those because we're really going to need that to weather the kind of storm that happens when we deal with conflict That, that's a, a point that I think will really resonate with many of us here. It will for me. Thanks, Rivera. Um, I did earlier see Ricky, your hand up. Did you still have a comment? Okay. And then go ahead, Michael. I truly am uh, a believer in nonviolence and um, and compassion. And I just put into the, uh, uh, the chat box that... Uh, uh, something that it may be contentious, but uh, I, I wonder how you get how you talk to people like Putin or people who are absolutely violent in their ways. But uh, it's a paradox. It's only a threat. And it, it supposedly would never happen. But if you said that we would exonerate anyone who kills somebody who demands of them or assigns them to kill somebody else, or will it would assign people below them to kill other people, then it would be all the way from bottom up, the threat. And um, I wonder if, not, not I wonder, I predict <laughs> that when there is no more wars, that will be a law. There, I'm just going to leave it as something to think about. Thank you for allowing me to express that. Well, I have not heard that thought before. So, Michael, that is something I will ponder a little bit. Thank you. Did you want to comment on that at all, Rivera? Uh, I have to think about it a little bit more. I'm glad Michael has brought it forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is Is there anyone else who would like to say something? Karen. Hi, Rivera. I am so delighted that you're here. I've read your your trilogy, and I think it's absolutely brilliant. And and how do we get that into every school library? I mean, mm-hmm. it, it's the blueprint for for doing this work, or for starting to do this work. It's brilliant. So thank you for that. And I was also um, I was going to mention Kazu Hagu, and you already know him, because he does do some amazing work himself. So it's thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Yeah, if you haven't read Kazuhaga's book, Healing Resistance, I highly recommend it. Yeah, it's well worth well worth the read. Thanks for that helpful comment, Karen. Um 
we will. It, Plowshares in Calgary is still a very small organization and and we really could use more volunteers. One of the things that Bev is very passionate about and others on our on our board as well is how do we develop some better materials and get them into the hands of teachers and parents, things that are focused on on, I guess, kids and parenting, but other resources as well. So if you have if any of you have any interest in being <laughs> more involved on that journey of trying to rebuild our resources and get them more broadly publicized and and accessible to our communities in Calgary, um, please just contact me or contact Haley at the office. We would love to have your involvement. So I, I agree with what you say, Karen. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could get the Ari Ara series, you know, in into every um, school in Calgary? Um, because people don't know about these resources. So any other um, comments or questions? Trudy. You're muted, Trudy. Okay, Trudy. am I unmuted? Yeah, you're good now. Uh, thanks a lot for your talk. It was so well organized, very informative, and um, extremely helpful and motivating. Uh, I've been working with this group for most of the past 40 years. And one of the challenges that I feel we face is that people basically don't think peace is very exciting. They find um, violent conflict and conflict that's almost violent extremely exciting. And I think I find this to be a real challenge. And I wondered if you had any specific ideas about how to make peace interesting. I mean, we've had various <laughs> ambitious ideas here which haven't quite worked because we don't have enough money and we don't have enough people power, but I'd be really interested in any suggestions you'd have in this area. Oh, that's a great question. You know, uh, this RER series that I wrote literally takes the fantasy genre and replaces all the war and violence with nonviolent action and waging peace. And so I've been contemplating the same question steadfastly for nine years and maybe uh, around a million words in print um, because it is an important question. Uh, but I think ultimately... The culture of war and violence stole excitement from storytelling, from everything else, because we've been around as a species for 300,000 years, just as Homo sapiens sapiens. War has only been around for about 12,000 years. The earliest recorded um, evidence of organized violence between groups is around 10,000 BC. So we have a lot more history with thing with human culture than we do with war. Uh, and you can be sure that stories were a part of that. So I like to think that war co-opted all the adventure, all the epics, all the myths, all the legends, all the excitement for its own purposes. And it's time for us to take it back. Um, I find that nonviolent action, nonviolent struggles, and peace campaigns are the most exciting things. I mm -hmm. find them to be far more courageous than fighting wars. I find people who are willing to stop tanks with just their bare hands and their bodies and their courage are the most insanely epic heroes that we could possibly imagine. And I think when we reframe what we're seeing that way, we start to see a whole bunch of new narratives emerging. And then the question is, how do we start to tell those stories? Do we challenge a graphic design class at the university to make new posters with these new kind of heroes, right? Do we um, get the, the young people who like to illustrate graphic novels to make graphic novels about the women of Liberia? Uh, so how do we use all of our arts and culture to tell these stories? Because the kind of stories we've been talking about tonight are, excuse my French, but badass. They're incredible. I mean, Hollywood should just be like going for broke on them. We would never have to tell another war story ever again. Uh, so, yeah, I think ask the artists to join in uh, and challenge people to apply their creativity to these kind of narratives. 
I've been doing it as a, a novelist for 10, 11 years now, and there's just no end to the creative potential. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rivera. That was uh, inspiring, and I, I think you gave us some possible directions of places that we can um, go to try to build from. Arthur, please go ahead. Yes, I, I agree with Rivera. The, uh, the idea is to replace the excitement of warfare, if that's what it is. Uh, by the way, uh, in the Vietnam War era, and it was when I uh, came to do the work that I'm doing. That is, I learned what the United States, I was in the United States Army Medical Corps stationed in South Vietnam. Uh, sorry, in South Korea, not South Vietnam, during the era of the Vietnam War. And it was during that era that I had time to read and think about what the United States government was doing. And uh, it was that war that turned me against warfare and led me to do But back to what Rivera is saying, uh, our, what we're doing here in Calgary, one of the, one of the many things that's going on um, the idea is to make Calgary an option A city. Now, I have to explain what that means. Martin Luther King Jr. said, we must learn to live together as, well, say human family, as brothers, or we will perish together as food. So I prefer option A, uh, learning, and it's, it involves a learning process. And the process of learning uh, I use the analogy of Ernest Hemingway's enthusiasm for Paris of the 1920s. Uh, Paris is a movable feast. And so one of the things that we're doing here in Calgary to make option, uh, Calgary an option A city, we're co-authoring a book that's to be published by October 2025. And the title of the book, uh, and quite a bit of it has already been written, by the way, the title of the book, Our City as a Movable Feast, for our time, and the subtitle, Intentional Cultural Transformation in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. So uh, with projects uh, ranging from, I talked to Shinobu uh, just very recently about an article she's published in Japanese that she'll translate into English and include in the book as a chapter in the book and so on. So we'll have about 16 to 18 chapters uh, in the book as planned so far including basic concepts of the first five chapters. And um, so uh, the it, it is a very, very intentional focusing on the city and making the city a microcosm of healthy global community and a joyful place to live, like Paris of the 1920s, intentional cultural transformation, but it includes along the lines of what Rivera has been talking about today. Mm -hmm. Thank you for, for sharing that, Arthur. I don't know if you wanted to respond to that at all, Rivera. Well, I think you're on to something there about the idea that we need to make the revolution irresistible, right? Mm -hmm. uh, our, our ideas are better than war and violence. They're way more fun. I mean, the U.S. military spends trillion dollars every year trying to convince us that this is a, a necessary and and cool thing to do. You know, their greatest problem is getting people to fight because human beings don't want to fight. Mm -hmm. We are not inherently violent creatures. Otherwise, it wouldn't have to train us to do these battles. Um, and so I think remembering that who we are as human beings is beautiful, is bold, is creative, is uh, contagious in that creativity is is the way to to build a movement and to remind people of what they inherently know, but uh, militarism spends a lot of time and money trying to get us to forget. Yeah, well said, thank uh, you. If I could just, uh, could I just, uh, 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 Lieutenant D David Grossman's book on killing, Rivera, you probably are familiar with it, uh, is extensive documentation of what you just said. Um, uh, military training has to work very, very hard to get uh, people recruited into the military, the vast, I mean, sure, they're psychopaths, there's a small minority of people, but the vast majority of people, uh, the uh, just, they do not want to kill 
other human beings. And if they're particularly in the old days when you're firing two firing lines facing each other, you mentioned the 1914 Christmas uh, thing that wor was worked out by the foot soldiers. Uh, this is rampant and the military training has to work very, very hard to get people to kill. And uh, mm -hmm. so this book on killing by David Grossman, Lieutenant Colonel, I guess he was, uh, is extensive documentation of that. And then the last section of that book, of course, is about how uh, the society itself is making the society violent, uh, not just with video games, but with the uh, it used to be that movies that where the killers were, they were weird people, but now they're making killers, I guess, that are more normal people. It's a very complex issue, but uh, we, we can, uh, as we've discussed, I think one of the important things tonight is that we can work joyously, actually, creatively, imaginatively uh, to make our city a movable piece for our time and work against this um, this insanity and, and sickness that Eckhart Tolle describes it in his book, The Power of Now. Sorry, I, I, see, here goes Arthur Clark talking so much again. Thank you, <laughs> thanks so much, Rivera. Thank, thank you, Rivera. Oh, always wise words, Arthur. Thank you. Um, it is getting on, and I know, Rivera, you're like two hours later than us. So Jan has had her hand up for a little while. Um, maybe we could just let Jan have the final question and then we'll we'll let you go for this evening. We could just, we need you to come out here, but I know <laughs> if you're ever out West, we certainly would welcome you. And may, perhaps there's some scope at some point for us to do some training with you online. Um, maybe we can do some exploration of that possibility. But, uh oh, Jan, are you still there? Uh, um, sure. So, okay. actually, I had a whole bunch of things to say, but <laughs> one quick question would be um, what could we be doing to support Russian resistors? Mm. I think. Uh, some of the things are like t telling their stories uh, here in the U.S. and Canada, making sure that people break down the monolithic idea of Russia as being all pro-war and to contextualize how vast their anti-war movement is. I mean, by comparative numbers to the populace, their numbers of arrest uh, in the early days of the anti-war movement were bigger than those of the George Floyd arrests in 2020 protests. I mean, this movement is was huge. And they have largely been suppressed at this point, but they are continuing to resist. So keeping your eye out for stories, talking about them, um, you know, uh, some groups like Fellowship of Reconciliation, international groups, war resistors may have some good contacts on the ground as well. Um, and I, I just feel like people need to know about the anti-war movement and to understand Russia as more than just a, a monolith in support of Putin. That maybe is the most important thing. Uh, so if I can ask the group a question, I would love it if you could put in a chat box your second answer on the scale from 1 to 10, 1 being not very likely, 10 being very likely. Uh, how possible is it for ordinary people like us to stop war? Four, we got some nines, seven, fours, six, eight, nine, eight. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, if you came up even just a little bit in your estimation, I feel like tonight was worth it. If you're still doubt doubtful, that's okay too. This is not, like, I'm not trying to convert you all to the cause of peace. I, I would love that. But uh, it's good to have skepticism. Skepticism makes us better strategists. Um, so thank you all for your time tonight. I'm going to put a few links in the chat box so you know where to find me. There's my website link. 
We've been talking quite a bit about the RER series, so I'll just make it easy and put that in the chat box for you. Uh, if you want to get on the mailing list, it's free for Nonviolence News. Uh, it's very easy to find and do. And then some of you have been asking about how you can learn more or do more. Um, I will be doing a six week version of this talk tonight, going through these stories in more depth and detail and talking about how we strategically apply them to our piecework. It's going to start on May 6th, so you are welcome to come. If money is an issue, this organization has scholarships available to anyone who just wants to send a quick email and say, I'd like a scholarship. So I'll put that there as a resource for you as well. And I just will say thank you all so much for spending this time. It's one of the things that we must do for peace is to always sit in in the position of learning more, to be curious, to learn these ideas, to listen to the stories of the people who have so courageously done this work in the worst possible situations in the world. If they can wage these struggles, I can spend the time to learn about them. And I want to thank you so much for uh, doing that with me tonight. And Maria, thank you for inviting me to do this talk. Yeah. yeah. I think we we are all very grateful to you, Rivera, for sharing your expertise and presenting to us in such a clear, um, empowering way all the research that you've done and the opportunities for further learning are really appreciated too. If any of you who would like those links, if you did not get a chance to, to get them, if you would like to just send a quick email to or Plowshares address, I will make sure that I pass them on to you. And uh, Rivera, we just wish you all the very best and enjoy the return of spring as it slowly <laughs> changes over there in Maine. And uh, know that you have a home with us here too, if you ever want to come out this way. We're really happy that you were able to join us tonight. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Namaste. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. <laughs> Hi, nice to see your face, Linda. Thanks for being with us. <laughs>